I thought I'd talk about superluminal motion. What does that mean? So superluminal means above light, so faster than light motion. This is not possible, everyone knows that. <laughs> well, I can show you a picture. Would you like to see a picture of some superluminal motion? So here's a picture. So this object, V838 Monosaurotis, in about 2002 suddenly went into outburst. And then there's a series of pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And as you can see, it's expanding. And that's just kind of, as ever, when you take a picture, you're kind of measuring the angular size of it. But because we know how far away this object is, you can translate that angular size into a real size and see how fast the object is actually increasing in size over time. And it works out it's expanding at about a light year per month. Now, given that the cosmic speed limit is the speed of light, which is a light year per year, kind of by definition, uh, a light year per month is about 10 or 12 times the speed of light. What's actually happened? It's a very bizarre object. So this is a very uninspiring star, I have to say, or it used to be a very uninspiring star. In that, So Monosaurus is, means it's in the constellation of Monosaurus, which is the unicorn, which is not a constellation many people have heard of because it's not a particularly exciting constellation. Um, and V838 means this was the 838 variable star found in this particular constellation. So again, it's not exactly top of anyone's list of anything until 2002 when all hell broke loose. It brightened up incredibly quickly. In a matter of days, it was 10,000 times brighter than it had been. At the point where it brightened up, it was about a million times as bright as the sun. The classical thing that does this is a thing called a nova. And there it's kind of a, probably a thermonuclear reaction happening on the surface of a white dwarf or something like that. This doesn't fit the bill. It doesn't have the properties of a nova. Something else very peculiar happened to this star. It's likely that it ate something. So it's likely that another star merged with it or a planet merged with it. So something fell into this star, which really stirred it up and heated it up and made it very bright for a fairly brief period of time. A pretty big incident in the history of the star system. It is. I mean, that's the interesting thing is that the star is still there. So nothing totally catastrophic has happened to it, but somehow it managed to get incredibly bright for a little while. Then after dinner it just calmed down again? It's faded back down again to kind of the level it was at before. Yeah. And the other thing that sort of became clear is it's actually there's a binary star in the middle here. So again, it might be something to do with the properties of the fact that it's a binary star in the middle, but no one's really quite clear what made it do this catastrophic brightening. There was this thing that, that appeared around it, which was indeed expanding faster than the speed of light. The natural way people think about these things is, well, there's been a big explosion, so it's the, just the stuff going out from the explosion. That clearly can't be the case because the stuff going out from the explosion is restricted by this speed limit of the speed of light, so it can't actually be a physical thing which is expanding. And what it actually is, is a thing called a light echo. So it's not actually a physical object expanding at all. It's just that in some sense, it's an optical illusion. Let me give you a, a kind of simple example of the same sort of thing, which I can do here in the, in the room. Okay, so if I take a laser pointer, if I shine the laser at the wall and then just move my wrist backwards and forwards a little bit, the beam moves backwards and forwards on the wall. Great. Now, if I move back further away from the wall and do exactly the same thing, so move my wrist by about the same amount, you see that the dot moves a lot further on the wall. Just a geometric effect that, you know, I'm further away from the wall, so actually, the, although the angle that it's moving through is the same, the distance the dot moves on the wall is further. Now, you could imagine if I were to add a powerful enough laser pointer, as I move further and further away, eventually I'd reach a point where just moving that little bit would actually make the dot move along the wall faster than the speed of light, because it's just going to keep going faster and faster. There's nothing to stop it. And we're not breaking any laws of physics by doing that, because actually, you know, there's nothing physical going on there. It's not like there's a particle moving along the wall faster than light. It's not like there's any information moving along the wall faster than light. But nonetheless, you can have something which, uh, you know, where the appearance of the dot actually moves faster than light on the wall. It's possible to have things that appear to move, or actually do move faster than light, right? That dot really would be moving faster than light if we were far enough away. But again, you're not breaking any of the speed limits. And that's kind of what's going on in this object here. Um, let me draw you a picture. It's probably the easiest thing to do. Okay, so here's the story. So here's us over here with our telescope pointing up into the sky. And here's the thing which suddenly went extremely bright. So the distant object that suddenly uh, brightened enormously due to whatever this peculiar phenomenon is. The extra bit we have to add to this picture is that before it went incredibly bright, probably in some previous explosion of some kind, it threw out a shell of material which is now just hanging around in a kind of a sphere. So this is a, a shell which is you know, light years away. So it must have been something that happened a long time ago, nothing at all to do with this present explosion. It might even have been left over from the formation of the star in the first place, but it's just some shell of material hanging out out there. The thing suddenly brightened up in 2002 and it basically lit up that sphere. It's like a lampshade lit up around it. But we didn't see the lampshade all lit up at the same time. We saw it, the first bit that was lit up was the bit that had the shortest path to us, then another bit a bit further out. It's a kind of ring of material in this, in this uh, debris field. And then a third, and so on. So over time, you'll see this expanding ring of material. Of course, the material itself isn't expanding at all. It's just this sphere of material sitting there. But it's because it's being lit up in this sequential way, you'll see it expand, this expanding ring of material that's getting lit up. And that's really all that you're seeing here.
Now it's a little bit more complicated because you can see there's lots of structure in this thing, so probably there's actually a whole series of these spheres of material around it, um, but the basic picture is the same, it's just a whole series of things all getting lit up in this sequential fashion. Just as with the laser on the wall, you know, it's just down to the geometry of the situation that if you set things up, you know, the difference between this path and this path isn't actually very big, and so actually the time delay between the direct route and the next route out isn't actually all that long, and so the, you know, the time for it to, to go from lighting up just the, the central bit to lighting this up, this much bigger ring can actually be quite short. And just by playing around with the geometry, you can make that speed anything you want it to be, including faster than the speed of light. If you were here on Earth pointing a really powerful laser pointer at the moon, you could presumably create this effect on the surface of the moon where the laser pointer is moving across the surface of the moon faster than light. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean if I was standing on the moon, this point of light on the surface would come towards me and then pass me at faster than the speed of light? It would. But of course, but there's not, it's not like it's a physical thing. It's not like it's a particle or a car or a rocket going past you faster than the speed of light. It's just a series of light, you know, light arrivals that, that shoots past you faster than the speed of light. So if I replaced that powerful laser pointer with a really big metal rod... Then you can't do it, because so then there's a physical entity which is actually travelling, and that you can't do. If you were trying to accelerate the end, you're trying to, by doing that, you're trying to accelerate the end of the rod to faster than the speed of light. And the laws of special relativity say, actually, in order to do that, you'd need an infinite force to do it. So you wouldn't need just a strong wrist, you'd need an infinitely strong wrist in order to do it. So, the, so where it falls down is the, the mass becomes so great, you just can't move the mass. It really is, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, it, it just is so, the inertia of the thing becomes so great that actually the laws of physics guarantee you can't do it with a, a physical thing the way you can with a beam of light. Does this optical illusion, this, this deception, cause problems for astronomers? It seems like something that could catch you guys out from time to time. You've got to be careful, right? In that if you were to, you know, you might try and do a naive calculation of trying to figure out how far away this object was if you didn't have any other constraints as to how far it was by saying, well, I know that this thing can't be expanding fast than the speed of light, I can see how fast it's expanding on the sky, that then tells me how far away the object can be. So indeed, you could get completely confused by making the wrong assumption that you're actually seeing a physical thing expanding and using that to infer something about the properties of the object you're looking at. Do light echoes occur anywhere else other than in gas shells surrounding stars or binary stars? I think they're the main place you see them. So we've seen them so for Supernova 1987A, for example, they're seeing light echoes still from the explosion from Supernova 1987A. But you really need something which produces a, a pulse in order to, to get a kind of an identifiable echo from different directions. And the, the main things that produce those kind of pulses are exploding stars in one form or another. So that leads nicely to the issue of second generation moon trees. I'm sure you can figure out what they are. These are the sons and daughters of original moon trees, of first generation moon trees. Just take the seeds, plant them somewhere else. Okay, we don't know exactly where the trees were planted. It was somewhere here at the Space and Rocket Center. So in order to figure out what the whole ground was like, <laughs> 